here we are. <clears throat> Good to have you here, John. You uh, don't need any any introduction. <laughs> Not only because you've been on our stage now, I think at least five times over the 10 or 11 year history of this conference, but uh, because of all of your amazing work um, around the world. So I think you've got some exciting, exciting uh, news to share with us. I think some things that you have not shared publicly, but um, at least perhaps not that publicly. Um, um, so I'll just, I'll let you take it away. Uh, for those who are in need, in need of a reminder or didn't read the, uh, the directions at the beginning, feel free to chat with each other in the chat boxes and post your questions for John in the Q&A box. And he's going to take it away. I think speaking extemporaneously, um, no, no slides, no slides uh, from this man. And um, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm looking forward to a rollicking conversation. So, all right, John. Thank you, Dan. Actually, Dan, if you could stay with me for a minute. Um, sure. I gave you no advance preparation, but I was as I was thinking about the the topics that I wanted to speak about, it occurred to me that actually uh, the inspiration for one of the topics, actually for several of them, came from you. And um, the the first piece that I want to speak about is our our uh, recent work on using mineral seed treatments in in addition to microbial seed treatments. Yep. And the the thinking behind this has been something I've been wanting to do for a long time, and it just never worked its way up to the top of the priority list, which seems to perpetually be growing longer instead of shorter. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, part of the the inspiration. For that idea was the realization of how much untapped genetic potential is in seeds and how rapidly uh, epigenetic expression can be improved from one generation to the next. And yes. a long time ago, I dare say it's probably 15 years ago, you shared the story with me of how you planted arugula from yep. two different seed sources side by side. One, one seed source. About it was the, and then the following generation. Can you tell us that story? Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, I think it was Astro. I'm pretty sure it was from Johnny's. Um, <clears throat> I planted. Uh, I bought three pounds of of Astro arugula seed, and um, planted two pounds of it. Um, in I think it was you know, probably July or something. Maybe 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 it's June. Um, got my three or four cuttings off of it, and then let it go to seed. Um, let it. Uh, when it had grown and gone to seed, and I, I pulled it up and got an old piece of greenhouse plastic, shook it out, um, and uh, and then planted that seed I'd saved, which had just basically grown on the land that summer, next to the one pound that I'd held back. Um, and uh, the variation in germination speed, in leaf color, in leaf thickness, in vigor, uh, was it was completely profound. It was completely profound. So can you can you yeah. give us a, a bit of a frame of reference for what you saw, Dan? If I if I remember correctly, um, you were indicating that you had roughly double the vegetative growth in the same amount of time. Where the the original parent seed was maybe three to four inches tall, uh, the seed that you had saved was already ten to eleven inches tall at the same time. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't usually like get that big because I was I was cutting it for BB greens, but. Um, yep. I mean, you know, arugula is particularly pissy as far as I'm concerned, you know, especially in a low input environment. Oftentimes, people it'll... who are not from New England, tell us what that means. <laughs> uh, that means it turns purple, it turns orange, it doesn't, okay. it, it, it just, you know, it's just got, you know, it's a little bit touchy. You know, some things germinate and, they're, and they've got great vigor and some things are just a little bit, a little bit um, particular. Um, I don't, I don't add a lot of fertilizer and I like to have my seeds, you know, do well in a, in a, in a, a living, a living soil ecosystem. So, um, yeah, I, you know, if optimal conditions are present, it'll germinate, it'll, it'll grow, it'll be fine. But, but it's, it, I find it oftentimes is just kind of weak, the seed you buy and to the point of epigenetic effect. And right. so I was just the thickness, the, the, the speed of germination, the, the thickness of the leaf, the dark, the green, the size of the leaf, the vigor of growth was uh, completely pronounced, and and all of yeah. this could some to some degree be anticipated by the seed size. I seem to remember you telling me that there were significant changes in the seed size as well. One hundred percent, one hundred percent, which you and I have been discussing, like you said, for more than fifteen years at this point. Yeah. I should have mentioned that mentioned at the beginning that I, you know, I, I like to. <laughs> 
I, I say, you know, the year I started really learning this stuff um, at Acres, I think you and I were sitting next, next to each other at a, a pre-conference, at Arden Anderson's pre-conference. That's how I remember it. Um, and it must have been 2006, 2007. Somewhere um, in there, yeah. Yeah, so I'm just um, honored to have uh, <laughs> known you all these years and, and proud to have watched you grow and become the amazing, amazing man you are and have started so young and, and be uh, brilliant. And one other thing I always say about you is, if I ever get a bit of a stuffed head, uh, you know, a, 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 a large head or whatever it is, all I need to do is speak to you for about five minutes, and that, that brings <laughs> right, right, da right down to uh, right down to size. So, yeah. Well, hopeful. Uh, hopefully, you're indicating that uh, some of my apparent humility transfers to you. <laughs> that was not my point. No, it was you're extraordinary. You're, you're extraordinarily intelligent and a, and a brilliant yeah. man. And so, if I ever begin to feel uh, feel like I'm God's greatest gift, all I need to do is just think about you, and that just keeps me in context. All right, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. All right. Yeah. you can you can stop there. But thank I'll you. I'll stop. I'll stop there. <laughs> um, I think we've all got our foibles and our egos and everything else. But as in, in general, you know, it's not often you meet you meet a a man of such brilliance, woman or man or, or incarnate being. So I just completely respect you. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, I want to not lose sight of... There, there's I'll turn one... my camera off now. That's fine. No, 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 no you're not done. Going. I'm not releasing you yet. Not quite okay. yet. There's one more, there's one more <laughs> question um, for for the benefit of our audience. Like I, I know the context, but what do you attribute that increase in seed size, seedling vigor, and plant growth in the arugula too. What was the context of that garden bed and what had you done to it in the past that you believe led to those outcomes? Well, I created, an, to the best of my ability, an optimal environmental condition for that um, incarnation to, to manifest. I had, um, so you know, established language. in English. <laughs> <laughs> I had done my mineral balancing. I had, you know, I had, I had addressed mineral deficiencies uh, based on soil tests. I had, um, you know, used various trace elements along with rock minerals. Um, I'd certainly inoculated the seed with, um, I'm pretty sure it was biocode gold, which I feel like I'm somewhat responsible for saying, John, we need a, a many <laughs> a multi species inoculant, and you're like, okay, I'll make one, and I'll, um, I, but yeah, so I certainly use that inoculated mineral balanced. Um, I, I'm always very attentive to early childhood development uh, phase of of a plant's life, and so I'm extremely attentive to the time between planting and germination that I maintain hydration and um, don't let the soil dry out. Um, um, you know, uh, but you know, just basic environmental conditions, maintaining hydration, aeration, sufficient minerals, good um, spectrum biology. And I think, you know, we've known from all of our elders, I mean, Jerry Bernetti always used to talk about this, about how they did the research with animals in the 50s and 60s with farm animals. And and they could, I think the story he told was they took the, the prize winning sow from the Iowa State Fair and um, took her piglets and fed them poorly and then their piglets and their piglets. And by three generations in, they were able to have downer pigs that couldn't stand up without breaking their legs. And then they took those pigs and fed them well. And in three generations, they're back to that prize winning conformity. Right. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And you know, Dan, this, the, the, the aspect of this story that made such an impression on me is uh, the speed of the two aspects about the speed of recovery of how rapidly this remarkable seed quality can be recovered. Yeah. But also the, I don't want to, to minimize the work that you had d done to, to achieve this outcome, but how relatively easy it was. Like That's the, the point, the, the work that you had done with soil amendments and, and uh, rock powders being added to your soil, increasing trace mineral availability and using biology and all these various pieces is this was, in reality, it's not that difficult. It's not. And nature, if you just give nature what she needs, just get out of the way and let her, I tell people, you know, let nature drop the seeds where they she wants them to be and let them germinate and they'll do better than the seeds you start six weeks earlier. And, you yeah. know, I mean, <laughs> we're taught to buy all kinds of things we don't need. And, but I mean, what what's really exciting, John, is that, you know, I mean, you and I have discussed this many times, the um, seed quality is one of the few things that you can't really address um, in one season. You know, a lot of things, if you buy the right product, you can address this deficiency, you can deal with minerals, you can do microbes, you can address a lot of systemic things. But it sounds like what you come up with with this 
mineral oh, yeah. feed treat is like, wow. <laughs> and this goes back, I think, to everything that Albrecht was doing, right? I mean, I'm not sure where you looked for the for the literature to be able to tease this out, but um, this is again hundred year old literature or or maybe eighty year old science. This is not new stuff, and you've yeah. just been taking it forward. So I'm good on you. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you, Dan, for indulging me and for for being willing to share that story. My um, pleasure. Yeah. There are... Am there I are, released again or not? Yes. Yeah, you're, I'll let you go. I'll turn my camera off <laughs> in 15 minutes. Yes. Sure. <laughs> um, there are, there are um, three major topics that I want to provide an update on. Um, I put together a short clip that I'm assuming most of you have seen, and I'm going to... Uh, mix up the order a little bit from what I had spoken of them in, in the video. I'm going to begin, given the conversation we just had, I'm going to begin by talking about our work with the mineral seed treatment, um, which has been ongoing for a while, but has really accelerated in the last year. And then also uh, provide an update on uh, the our work with infield testing. And I'm uh, there's some there's some pretty exciting updates there. And then also uh, in parallel with that, uh, the work that we are uh, hoping to begin soon, we've done some very early stage work to uh, validate proof of concept, but uh, we'll be actually commercially commercializing uh, microbiome analysis that is a tenfold step forward from the current state of the technology that's available in the space. So... I'm quite excited about each of those. And if we have time and if there's the opportunity, I'll also speak a little bit about Integrity Grown. But uh, I think that that validation and verification or, in, or regenerative verification has taken on a life of its own in a very um, spectacular fashion and deserves, uh, each of these deserve an update of their own, but I'll try to provide an update there as well. So um, when, as as Dan has shared, he and I, um, our our paths have been intertwined and kind of parallel for what is it now, fifteen, I suppose, close to twenty years, and um, there have there have been many joint sources of inspiration. Uh, we've read many of the same books. We've had many of the same mentors, and um, it was. I don't know that I can, I don't know where the credit belongs exactly for the idea of biocode gold. You know, it's just one of those ideas you, you, it becomes kind of obvious once you read enough and talk to enough people, but the, uh, the biocode gold came out of the realization that uh, our seeds microbiome is terribly compromised and that if we want to establish seeds and get them off to a very strong start and have that root system be immediately colonized immediately after the seed germinates, then we need to have a broad array of what I would just broadly categorize as disease suppressive microorganisms. We need to have the, the endophytic bacteria. We need to have the endophytic fungi. We need to have mycorrhizal fungi, saprophytic fungi. There's this broad array of different microorganisms that uh, that are essential to get colonization immediately after germination. And what we observed in uh, doing some quite elementary research is that our, our um, perception as a combination of result of abysmally poor seed quality, plus seed treatments, plus poor soil biology, and just the, the perfect a storm of less than ideal conditions that is so common in mainstream agriculture. We observed that it is also less than ideal planting conditions. We observed that it is common to have anywhere from a 10 to a 14 de uh, de day delay, 10 to 14 day delay between the moment the seed begins germinating and the first root radical emerges and when uh, that root system becomes effectively colonized with microorganisms that have in many cases need to be need to be recruited from the soil microbiome and this 10 to 14 day window is the the prerequisite one of the prerequisite preconditions that is almost a requirement for severe disease expression later in the plant's life so often we have anthracnose and fusarium and these are the organisms that 
um, appear to cause disease when the plants get to the fruit fill stage or close to the harvest stage. But the reality is the initial infection happened in that two week window immediately after germination. So that realization led to the development of biocode gold and biocode gold is there is this, there is this little um, tidbit or secret um, that most the, the, the manufacturers of most inoculants don't really want to talk about or speak about. And that is, and by the way, this also holds true for a lot of compost and compost teas, uh, greater than 90%, depending on which references and citations and what research you read, uh, the number is sometimes is listed as 95 plus percent of all of the known soil microorganisms can only be propagated in the presence of a living plant root. That means you cannot propagate them in the lab and you cannot propagate them in a compost pile and you cannot propagate them in a vermicompost pile. Uh, they require the presence of a living plant root. And also a majority, I don't know exactly what the number is, but a majority of the bacterial population that is in the soil profile, uh, as, as well as a large number of fungi are non-spore forming. So they do not readily stabilize in a product in a jug. And this is an advantage that compost tea and compost extracts and so forth would have. But they also suffer the disadvantage of, of not being able to propagate the microorganisms that require the presence of a living root system. So the idea behind BioCode Gold was let's develop a microbial inoculant that is actually propagated in the presence of a living root system and that um, contains all of these organisms that are required. Anyway, uh, I, have to, I have to be very cautious about what I des describe around BioCode Gold and the things that we say only because in order to, to jump through the regulatory hoops that are required to be able to have a product that's registered and that's on the marketplace, you, you have a list of things and certain concentrations, things that you can say. So I can't say that BioCode Gold contains hundreds or thousands of different organisms because if it's not on the label, then uh, technically it doesn't exist according to the regulators. And if I say otherwise, then uh, that could get us into a pile of trouble. But um, as, as we've used BioCode Gold for the last decade, uh, there was th still this realization that while uh, there were there were a number of cases where uh, the the treated versus untreated areas where we we were using biocoat gold on a and we, we at this point we've used it on dozens of different crops on a very large scale it's one of our most popular products in terms of the number of it gets applied to millions of acres every spring and we still had this observation that um, in some cases we are still having too much time, too much of a time delay between germination and actual inoculation. And in this case, it was not a question of not having the presence of the microorganisms because we have added the biocoat gold and we have enough field evidence to know that it can colonize immediately in a matter of 24 to 48 hours. It can colonize very rapidly. And yet it didn't in all situations, in all contexts. And we tried to understand why. And it soon became obvious that in those cases where we failed to have colonization rapidly, it was a reflection of the seed quality being so abysmally poor and seeds having such a low inherent energy content that they could spare no sugars to be sent out through the root exudates to trigger the initiation and germination and the development of this micro, um, microbiome immediately around the root system. They couldn't provide any root exudates because the seed was essentially starved. And the other observation was that these seedlings that were starved were, uh, and these seeds, seeds and seedlings that were starved were starved not just for mineral nutrients, or excuse me, not just for sugars, but also for mineral nutrients. I find it interesting. I have uh, one of the books that I really enjoyed looking at and paying close attention to is a corn production guide from Iowa State University that was published in 1972. And it was one of the first production guides, actually, one of the first ones that I've seen. Um, 
early ones that I've seen that included extensive full color photography. And so they have extensive photography of what the germination stage of the corn should look like. And it's remarkable that their described optimums and ideals are for a corn seedling to emerge from the ground and to be dark green, vigorous, photosynthesizing as soon as that shoot emerges. Today, we have come to the expectation, kind of the subconscious expectation that seeds, when seedlings emerge from the soil, they are a pale yellow green. And there is a period of time anywhere from a few days to a week and sometimes more in challenging weather conditions before that plant eventually becomes dark green and really begins photosynthesizing well. And that is an expression of that seed and therefore the seedling being starved for mineral nutrients, not having enough magnesium, not having enough manganese, not having enough iron, not having all the trace mineral uh, elements that are required for good photosynthesis to happen quickly. So some time ago, we started experimenting with what happens. So we, with the BioCoat goal, we believe that we're addressing the microbial population with the best available technology today. And how do we partner that with a mineral seed treatment that can overcome the shortages of really poor seed quality? And that led to the development of a product we released this spring called Seed Flare. And Seed Flare is simply a mineral, a concentrated mineral seed treatment. It, it, it contains magnesium, iron, manganese, cobalt, uh, copper, zinc, boron, molybdenum, and probably a few others that I'm forgetting. Um, so it contains, uh, as you notice, um, in the, the list that I provided is very focused on um, the trace mineral metals. And it is also very focused on all of the elements that are needed as enzyme cofactors <clears throat> that are unlikely to be contained in the seed in adequate amounts. And so the intention was to develop a product that can be applied as a liquid to the seed well in advance of planting, months at least, and possibly even years. That uh, is actually when it is applied to the seed, it is so readily absorbable that it immediately crosses the um, seed shell, the seed outer membrane, and uh, is actually absorbed into the seed and is present within the seed and can move around within the plants. Uh, once, the, once the seed begins absorbing water after it's planted, these nutrients can move around inside the seed wherever the seed needs them. And um, we've been successful in achieving this outcome. We are. Uh, we have. Ex we've done extensive experimentation at this point, uh, applying this product as a straight concentrate with no added water, adding water to it uh, for for better distribution. We've experimented with different application rates. We have uh, done applications, and so the the original intent, the original way that we were thinking about this, was uh, designing it for broad acre crops. So, using it on corn, beans, wheat, rice, uh, canola, etc., and so our frame of reference, which Dan laughed at, <laughs> was um, in applying what was the quantity of product that we were applying per ton. So at this point, we've done extensive experimentation ranging all the way from two liters per ton to 20 liters per ton. And uh, so far, we have only gotten increasing benefits with higher application rates. And um, we have not yet achieved the point of having any downsides. Um, not even of any boron toxicity or anything like that on, on the crops that we've been experimenting with. So what has been exciting, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm trying to downplay my, uh, my level of enthusiasm here so I don't get too carried away, but um, what has been exciting is the speed at which seedlings are emerging out of the ground. Uh, we have very rapid emergence, very rapid germination, and immediate dark green leaves and strong photosynthesis within hours to days, within a single 24 hour first, first sunlight exposure, we have leaves that are dark green. We have, I think I may have shared um, 
At this point, we haven't published a whole lot on it. We're still collecting a lot of data. But I did share one leaf on social media of uh, or one set of photos from a cotton farmer. And uh, his his expression, his his words were that these cotton leaves look like an artificial plant. They look like plastic because they are so thick and they have this strong waxy coating. So that is an expression of these, these seedlings having an abundant energy immediately right after germination. And what we're seeing in parallel is that because these seeds have so much energy and such a rapid immediate photosynthesis, they are able consistently to supply a lot more sugars out through the roots and through the root exudates to stimulate the soil microbiome. And we're getting remarkable colonization, uh, soil colonization or root colonization of the microbiome like we have seldom observed up to this point. And um, so the good news is that uh, when we add, even at the highest application rates, when we were applying 20 liters per ton of seed, uh, that adds, uh, this is going to escape my memory right now. If I recall correctly, that adds uh, a half percentage point of moisture to the seed in storage. So if you have, let's say if you have a seed that is being stored at 10% moisture and you add the highest application rate of this liquid, uh, liquid mineral treatment, it would move, it would change the moisture kind of the seed from 10% to 10.5%. And by the way, the seed itself, uh, there is no moisture on the outside. After about uh, 24 to 36 hours, maybe 48 hours for canola seed and some of the seeds that have a stronger seed coating, um, all of those nutrients are absorbed into the seed. Uh, the seed is perfectly dry and flows through seeding equipment and drilling equipment as if though it had never been treated, uh, just like the original seed. And so the intent was to, to try to apply a small enough quantity of liquid that we wouldn't make the seed soft and um, that, would, that it could possibly be damaged during uh, while flowing through the planting equipment. So um, the, the, the results so far this spring from crops that have been and seeds that have been treated with seed flare are simply remarkable. We have uh, a seed corn company in the Midwest that um, has been conducting extensive experimentation with seed flare and with BioCoat Gold and also with a couple of other biostimulants, uh, conducting what they call cold germination trials through a third party seed lab. And so their cold germination trials are they're deliberately germinating seeds in very challenging conditions. I believe 42 degrees Fahrenheit is the, is the cold germ uh, lab temperatures. And uh, the short version is that <laughs> the the quote of of one of the um, seed company's employees who was in charge of conducting all the experiments and setting up all the trial designs, uh, his quote in his email was, seed flare appears to make dead seeds come alive uh, because all of the seeds that, uh, and, and all of the comparison treatments, all the seeds that otherwise uh, historically would not have germinated, uh, they might have 5% or 10% or in some cases as high as 30% lack of germination, depending on the seed lot that they were testing. And uh, when treated with seed flare, almost all of those seeds germinated successfully. So all of that has been quite exciting. And I think uh, the way that I'm thinking about seed flare is this is an opportunity for us. Many of us are in the situation where we are still buying seed. Uh, we are not in a situation where we're saving a lot of our own seed, although I believe that is the ideal we should be striving for. But if we are in the situation where we are needing to buy a commercially produced seed that probably has little or no consideration given to quality, seed flare and BioCoat Gold in combination is an easy and inexpensive opportunity to cover up a lot of the sins of the previous generation or to recover from the sins of the previous generation. Um, so, that is all, it's all quite exciting. And, and of course, um, we've, we've formulated and put this all into a product that is, e that is easy to use, but I'm certain people are going to try to imitate it on their own based on the information that is on the label. Although, yeah, um, thanks to regulators, a lot of information doesn't get put on the label. That's just the reality of the situation. Um, all right, so I'm going to switch gears and uh, the next topic I want to speak about 
Um, actually, I'm going to speak about the biome lab, the microbiome lab first, because I have a feeling once I start speaking about crop ticks, I might not be able to stop before the end of the hour. Um, in September of last year, we hired Dr. Laura Cavanaugh to come work for AEA as the uh, as our new chief science officer. And one of the reasons that I really desired to work with Laura was to help her commercialize and develop uh, further develop the technology that she had pioneered uh, previously before coming to work for us. And uh, this is this is a bit perhaps. Uh, there is an element where this is outside my scope of expertise and outside of my understanding. Um, so I'll just, if, if any of you want to have any of the detailed technical questions around exactly what this is and, and uh, what it looks like, then I may not be able to answer those. But I, I can give you a quick overview. Um, the, the microbiome or the DNA sequencing technology that is presently in use and is available or measuring and testing agricultural soils is, uh, as I understand it, what was described to be second generation technology. The third generation microbiome or DNA sequencing technology has been available, has been on the marketplace for roughly, uh, I was about to say a decade, but I'm not sure it is that long, but it's five or six years at least. Uh, it has been extensively used in the medical field. No one has adapted it for use in the agricultural field. It, uh, the third generation technology enables much longer reads, much longer read times, uh, or read sequences rather. And as a result, you are able to get much more precise information about precisely which species or which genomes, uh, genomic sequences are present. And also, you are able to get much higher resolution on um, the, uh, how do I say this correctly? As a result of the longer read times, not only do you have a much greater degree of accuracy on exactly which species are present, but you also see much more data overall and you see um, smaller populations more easily. So as a result, um, this is this is my understanding. I've seen some of these uh, incredibly long reports of, of the genetic sequences that have come out. We're in the process of developing a reporting format that is easy easy to read and easy to understand. But as I understand it, the third generation technology is going to give us roughly an order of magnitude more data than the second generation technology. We're going to be able to see a much larger number of species and with a very high degree of accuracy. And the good news is we're still in the process. So um, the, the announcement is that uh, we have we have made the decision, we've pulled the trigger. Um, there is still setup work that needs to be done. And there is, I don't even have a website landing page or anything that I can point you to yet at this point. This is still a very early stage. But by the end of September, uh, beginning of October this year, we will be able to offer this, this microbiome sequencing uh, to the world for a very affordable price. We're still in the process of figuring out pricing, but uh, we look to be roughly in a, the ballpark of a third to a half of the price tag of the currently available uh, microbiome DNA sequencing. And also, as I understand it, there is no restriction on the material that we can test. We can measure the DNA sequences that are found inside a plant, in the leaf, in the root system, inside a fruit, inside the seed, on the seed surface, um, in the soil. There's, there are no limitations to the substrate that we can extract DNA from, as I understand it. Or if there are, we haven't discovered them yet. So um, I'm quite excited about the, the promise of having affordable um, an affordable microbiome testing lab because that, that is actually able to give us good data and good information that we can make management decisions from. Because the reality is that agronomy, agronomy over the last century has been defined in terms of chemistry for the very good reason that chemistry is what we were easily able to measure. 
It's what we could measure in the laboratory. We didn't have the ability to measure the microbial populations in the microbiome. And um, also, I think we, we need to quite clearly understand that when we have this, this new level of detail, this additional detail that we've never been able to see before, it's going to open up completely new frontiers of information uh, and completely new frontiers of understanding interactions that we are going to have to figure out from the beginning because we don't know what those are. What do you mean the dose are? I'm so sorry, but I'm going to have to ask you to excuse me for 15 seconds. Be right back. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mohan. Now, that was the best interruption that you could possibly imagine. <laughs> it was my four year old daughter, Lillian. Um, so, the, the reality is, I believe what I expect to come out of this, this is, this is my hope and this is my vision, is that, uh, as, as you know, I'm, I'm about to talk about um, our developments in in-field uh, nutrient measurement and sensing. But even without that, if we just, if we were able to match this, um, this if we're able to match the microbiome data with plant nutrient absorption, all of a sudden, we have the, the foundational science to completely change the nature, to completely change the conversation around nutrient absorption. What I fully expect to find is we will, uh, I expect that we will find once we have a larger data set and are able to unleash machine learning on it um, and AI, I expect we will find that, oh, all of these fields, all these crops that are doing a really good job of absorbing phosphorus without lots of phosphorus fertilizers being applied, they have this particular grouping, this particular consortium of maybe 20 or 50 or 100 microorganisms that are present in those soils as a group. Because this is where uh, mainstream microbiology in the last couple of decades has really gone down the wrong path. They have been guided down the wrong path by a need to develop protectable intellectual property uh, in the form of products so that they can pay for their research is we have focused on, or the industry generally has focused on identifying a specific microorganism for a specific task. Mycorrhizal fungi solubilizes phosphorus. Well, yes, it does, but it also does about a thousand other things or more. Um, and we, we have uh, gone down this 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 wrong path of trying to identify a single microorganism, but we know and we understand that once we have quorum sensing across an entire microbial community, then we now have a microorganisms that take on specialized functions, but they are dependent on the entire group in order to take on those specialized functions. And uh, I expect, I hope to be able to see the data that we can begin associating groups of microorganisms with specific crop responses uh, and also associating different groups with different plant species and with their associated microbiomes and so forth. So it's a very exciting, uh, very exciting frontier. Um, and this is going to be available commercially uh, towards the latter part of this year and into next year. And it's, uh, I think it'll be, it'll be quite exciting for everyone to have access to that. So now, We'll go to uh, the piece that I, I really, I really have to contain myself in thinking about and talking about um, in-field crop nutritional measurement. This is an idea that was really inspired by Dan. Um, it's a, it's a derivation of Dan's idea of uh, that he's been speaking about for the last. 15 years or maybe 20 of being able to have a nutrient density meter. Um, so to be clear, what I'm describing is, is not exactly, or at least I don't think, is not exactly what Dan envisioned in terms of a nutrient density meter, but it instead is designed to be used as an agronomic management tool by farmers and by agronomists. So the vision that we set out with roughly, what is it now, a year and a half, or maybe two, you know, I think a year, year and a half ago, maybe two years ago. The vision was to have an infield instrument that can measure a plant's mineral profile. So uh, the emphasis being on the mineral profile rather than the phytonutrient profile, measuring some of the phytonutrients like um, 
chlorophyll and carotenoids and various amino acid and peptide profiles is relatively easy. It's a lot easier than measuring the mineral profiles. So if you want to measure uh, calcium, magnesium, sulfur, zinc, manganese, copper, boron, et cetera, um, developing the sensors to do that in field uh, and uh, the miniaturized sensors and uh, calibrating them to do so accurately and consistent, consistently has been a challenge that many companies have attempted to crack. Some have made some modest uh, strides forward, but no one has really developed a tool that is universally applicable across many different crop types. And that really gives a thorough range of information. And uh, the good news is, uh, I can tell you today that I believe we have succeeded in creating that tool. Um, there is, we have, at this point, we have completed our first phase of calibration work. And there is further calibration, uh, extensive further calibration that needs to happen. But um, uh, there's, let me see, which of these pieces do I talk about? Um, so we are, the ultimate vision for this device is that, um, and this is, this is a several year development plan, but the ultimate vision is to have a device that includes three separate sensors. So we have successfully calibrated uh, both the first and the second sensor on um, a handful of crops already. And the, uh, the third sensor is still to be developed. But the, the good news is, um, I think what I can tell you at this point, uh, there, are, there are some pieces that we have that we have not yet done fully. We haven't fully developed the calibrations for a few specific minerals. For example, I think uh, molybdenum and cobalt and selenium and iodine and a few of those are still in the development. Um, but if you would have asked me the question 18 months ago, what is what is our, oh, I, in fact, I was asked the question, what is our what is our likelihood of success? What's the probability of success of actually being able to develop this tool in the field um, I would have, I would have, uh, I don't have a qualified opinion because I'm not an optical engineer and I don't really, don't really have the qualifications to evaluate the pop probabilities of success. And so with that, with that caveat, I told the people who asked me that question, I said, well, in the absence of having a qualified opinion, I, uh, my gut is that we're somewhere in the neighborhood of a 50% likelihood of success, 50% likelihood of failure. Well, that is no longer the case. I now believe we have upwards of a 95% likelihood of success because we've already done it. We've already succeeded on, um, on developing the calibrations for many of the minerals, which were thought to be the most difficult to develop calibrations for. And so uh, what this means is what we have right now, we have a handheld device, um, at the moment, the handheld device only uh, includes one sensor and the second sensor has been calibrated, but it is still uh, lab bench mounted at this point. And the, we're able to measure a mineral profile. So all of the major macronutrients that you would expect to see on a, on a sap analysis or on a thero soil analysis. And the second sensor includes, or the second sensor is Raman spectroscopy. And for those of you, I know that Dan is grinning from ear to ear right now, but for those of you who don't know what that means, uh, Raman spectroscopy actually requires no calibration in order to be able to measure hundreds of phytonutrients and hundreds of compounds. So not only will, be able, will we be able to measure a complete mineral profile, will also, with the exact, at the exact same instance, be able to measure a broad range of phytonutrients, chlorophyll content, carotenoid content, um, amide groups, protein groups, et cetera. Uh, as, as I understand it, and again, this is not my area of expertise, but as I understand it, we're going to be able to comprehensively measure the carbohydrate profile, uh, the amino acid and protein profile, the... Uh, lipid and oil profile, uh, essential fatty acid profile, I should say, and 
Also, the, we can directly measure waxes and cuticles and the thickness of wax on the plant leaf surface. So um, as if though all of this weren't good, good news enough yet, what really got my attention is the team who is, uh, in, is responsible for developing the calibrations for these devices. Um, in our, in our, early, our first phase calibration work, we sought to develop calibrations um, that matched out and that would produce matched up and would produce similar readouts as SAP analysis and as tissue analysis. And I didn't particularly expect that we would be successful, but they have been successful. And this, this is quite remarkable because what this means is we are able to put a sensor on a leaf surface. This is non-destructive. We're put, able to put a sensor on a leaf surface. The sensor does not measure what's on the leaf surface. It actually measures through the leaf. So we're getting everything all the way through the leaf back out. And in the case of, let's use calcium as an example, we are able to get one calcium number that correlates with a high degree of accuracy with the SAP analysis number. In fact, from what we can tell, it is more consistent and more repeatable than the SAP analysis because we're not introducing extraction error. And in addition, it also correlates to, they're, a, they're able to produce a different number output that also correlates to calcium and tissue analysis. And the reason this is remarkable is because calcium and SAP analysis and calcium and tissue analysis do not correlate to each other. There's a reason we use SAP analysis because it doesn't track it or it doesn't correspond to tissue analysis. But now for people who are familiar with the use of tissue analysis, we can produce a readout that exactly matches the readout of tissue and also a readout that matches the readout of a SAP analysis. And this tells me that the, uh, the machine learning uh, and the, the algorithm development that we unleashed on the spectral signatures to identify these signatures for for calcium in the leaf is using is is using different reflectance signatures is using different reflectance patterns for calcium and uh, and tissue as it is for calcium and sap which would be what you would expect because when you have calcium incorporated into cell membranes then of course you're going to have a different reflectance pattern than you will with calcium that is free flowing in the in the um in the xylem tissue so um i'm quite excited about those developments because what this means uh, and just so to, to give you some idea and expectation of timelines, um, this means that in there is a there's a slim possibility that we might release um, the first sensor for use on some crops in 2025. Um, it's worth noting that uh, we we are still in the process of figuring out the degree to which calibrations need to be developed, but we are, I'm, my hypothesis, I'm reasonably certain that we're going to need to develop different calibrations for different leaf types. So for example, uh, a cabbage leaf, as a result of its uh, waxy nature and the different leaf cuticle leaf structure is going to require a calibration that is different from from let's say cucumber leaves or zucchini leaves, which is going to be different again from let's say citrus leaves. But I do think that um, I'm, I'm optimistic based on what we've seen so far, there, there's more homework that needs to be done, but I'm quite optimistic that we will be able to develop calibrations for groups of plants. So once you have a calibration for zucchini, it seems reasonable that that is going to transfer to butternut squash, all types of winter squash and gourd, and the entire, the entire cucurbit family and perhaps others as well. Similarly for brassicas, if you develop a calibration set for brassicas, I think that um, I suspect that's going to calibrate across plant groups. So as a result of that, um, there is uh, the work that is left to be done before we can release this device is extensive calibration work. Um, the target timeline is spring of 26, uh, March of 26, for release of the completed device with both first and the second sensor. And um, in case you're wondering, uh, we're still in the process of figuring out the details of the business plan, but uh, the device is going to be very affordable. Uh, perhaps not affordable. Well, 
perhaps not affordable by a market gardener, but affordable by a commercial farmer and affordable by a group of market gardeners who um, go together and use it collectively as a group. So that is one of the one of the mandates. One of the things that I'm fairly insistent on with this technology is that um, it be able to democratize access to information and democratize and, and provide uh, easy access to growers at all scales. So uh, yeah, I'm pumped. I'm trying not to show it too much, but I'm pretty excited. And a big thank you to Dan for all of the encourage and inspiration over the years to and the vision of what could be possible with sensor development. It's taken it's taken 20 years, but here we are. Um, I'm I'm quite pleased with with the trajectory and the pathway that we're on at the moment. Um, so I think I see lots of questions and see a lot of uh, chatter going on as well. I, I think I'm going to pause there. I might give all of you a quick update on Integrity Grown. Um, I'm not going to go into detail on what Integrity Grown is. Let's just say that um, integrity, we developed Integrity Grown somewhat reluctantly as a regenerative agricultural verification that is based on integrity. It's based on integrity of outcomes. It's based on integrity of the supply chain. It's based on integrity of the grower being a good stewardship of the entire ecosystem. Uh, there are, we've, I believed from what we observed in the landscape um, and the other regenerative verifications that are in the space that there are some very fundamental pieces that uh, were not being considered. And um, the, the ultimate vision of Integrity Grown is that I believe we do not need, we do all of the verification schemes, whether it's organic certification or some local regional environmental thing like Chesapeake Bay verification or Salmon Safe, and the list goes on. There are over 400 verifications that are present in North America at this point. It's it's uh, slightly ridiculous. So why would we, why would we presume be so presumptuous as to add one more? Um, well, the reason we did so is because every single one of these other presentations, as far as I know, or every single one of these other certifications, puts 100% of the responsibility and the burden of proof on the farmer. And sometimes compensates him for that and sometimes doesn't do such a great job of compensating the farmer for assuming this responsibility. So it is 100% putting the responsibility on the grower and no one else in the supply chain is assuming any of the responsibility. And it's true that there are some of these things that they can't assume, but I believe that the, the fundamental a foundational piece, if we want to have regenerative agriculture become mainstream and become global in a significant way, that there, the, the only way to facilitate that is to reward good stewardship and to create the capacity for stewardship. We know that there is such a thing as an optimal heart's to acres ratio. In order to be a good steward, you can only be a good steward of a certain size landscape. Now that size landscape is different in the grazing Western prairies and the Eastern Rocky Mountains and, and the grazing lands, grasslands, than it is in other ecosystems. There's, there's not a one universal size fits all, but there certainly is an optimal for in each ecosystem, there is an optimal a ratio, an optimal range of how many acres can one heart or one group of hearts be a good steward of. And the reality is right now, we don't have enough good stewards in the landscape. We do not have enough farmers. And if we want to have more farmers, if we want to have more good stewards, then there has to be an economic opportunity for people to come into agriculture and to thrive. We have deteriorating rural communities right now. We have a uh, rural talent drain. Uh, we have, if, if people who are uh, young people who are smart and hardworking could leave farming, could leave agriculture and could apply the same level of intensity and focus and talent to other enterprises, 
as they do to farming and earn five to six times the salary. And that is just ridiculous situation. If we want to facilitate regeneration in the long term and on scale, we have to regenerate the capacity for stewardship, which means that we need to pay farmers well. So I believe the, the vision that I hold for Integrity Grown is that um, in the future, we are not verifying farmers. We're actually doing some of this right now. Uh, we are not verifying farmers. Instead, we are verifying CPG companies. Uh, and in, the case, in our case, the company that really launched Integrity Grown was a, a collaboration request by Citizens of Humanity. And in our case, uh, we are verifying Citizens of Humanity. They are bearing the burden of responsibility for making sure that their supply chain is regeneratively is, is regenerative. And as a part of that regenerative verification, there is this fair trade component. My apologies for the noise in the background. Uh, there is this fair trade component, and I'm calling it for, I don't particularly like the phrase fair trade, but I don't have a better alternative right now. Uh, there is this component where they need to ensure that they are compensating their farmers well and paying them well. In the case, in some case of Citizens of Humanity, uh, that translates to, I forget exactly, I think maybe a 25 or 30% premium over uh, market price for cotton. And so the, the long range vision is for integrity grown to verify the quality of outcomes. We actually measure pesticide residues rather than rather than um, having this whole binary uh, polarizing conversation to say, oh, you must use tillage and you can't use Roundup versus other people saying Roundup is less damaging to the soil than tillage is in their context. We just eliminate that entire conversation. We just bypass all of it and we say, it's actually, it's very simple. What we're going to do is we're going to measure the glyphosate load in your crop that you're harvesting, whether it's small grains or cotton or what have you, we're going to measure the glyphosate load. If you believe that in your system and your management context requires you to use glyphosate, then that is a choice that can be acceptable underneath this verification, but the glyphosate level in your crop needs to meet this minimum threshold or this maximum threshold. And that completely changes the nature of the conversation to now, all right, well, if I want to include glyphosate, then that necessarily means I need to restore my soil microbiome and I need to have really good biology so that whatever pesticides I apply is immediately degraded within a matter of weeks after being applied so that it doesn't show up in my crop. So all of a sudden we start having a conversation about trade-offs because we're measuring the quality of outcomes quality of outcomes, both in the presence of nutritional quality, the presence of nutrient density, et cetera, nutritional integrity, as I like to call it, but also the absence of toxins, the absence of pesticide residues, the absence of molds and mycotoxins, aflatoxins, the list goes on and on. So that is the, that is the vision for Integrity Grown. We started, uh, our, our first entry into this space was with verifying cotton. Uh, we are in the process of developing verification standards for other crops right now. And um, we will be launching, we will be rolling out additional crops, possibly as early as the end of this year, but for certain by next spring, uh, we're, we're going to be expanding the work of Integrity Grown into a very broad uh, scope in terms of crops and also in terms of international scale. We're currently working on coffee, wheat, wine grapes, and I forget there's one or two more. And uh, the vision is to have an international scope and scale and uh, be able to facilitate these conversations in a much bigger way than they've been happening up to this point. So I think I'll call that a wrap um, and I'll open it up for Q&A. Brilliant. <clears throat> Completely brilliant. <laughs> Thank you, Dan, you're the inspiration. I expect well. nothing less and you always, you always <laughs> meet expectations and then some. Um, I've got about 20 questions written down here, um, but I like to give, uh, you know, Erwin and, and Adrian and, and Dietmar an opportunity at least to get a couple in before I, before I take my, my 20 minutes of, of time. <laughs> Adrian, looks like you're ready to, to offer a couple. Um, yeah, thanks for the presentation, John. 
Um, I just wonder for the seed treatment, and there are many listeners from Africa and from Europe and all over the world, and sadly we don't get your products. Uh, if you may, can give some tips, like we already work sometimes with, with compost tea or Johnson Soup compost to get a bit the biology, but with the minerals, I sometimes struggle from where should I take rock dust, should I take uh, algae extract or what in your thoughts is a good source of a basic trace minerals? Um, for the, well, you, you can derive, I, I have to be so cautious about what I say from a regulatory perspective. Um, so our source material for developing this is purified uh, trace mineral sulfates. So rather than rock powders, you, you, because we're looking for a material that actually can penetrate into the seed, not be on the seed surface, but can actually penetrate into the seed, it needs to be a high quality liquid chelate uh, and preferably not an EDTA. So it needs to be an amino acid chelate or an organic acid chelate or something of that nature. So those are the nature of the materials that we are using. Now, it is interesting to note that um, I would actually suggest you not combine these trace mineral seed treatments with a compost extract they, uh, or with any other microbial inoculant um, in, in the same tank mix, in the same combination, because the, the trace minerals, in order to be effective and to produce the effects that we, are, that we are observing, are very concentrated. And they're concentrated enough, if you think, I mean, boron and copper and some of these elements, uh, manganese, have a biocidal effect in a concentrated solution. So they will actually uh, could have the effect of damaging the microbiome in a concentrated mix. So that's why uh, one of them needs to be applied to the seed and be inside the seed, and the other is best on the seed surface. And the um, just a corollary or follow up on that: <clears throat> if you have a reasonable um, core microbiome or any core microbiome on the seed before you apply this, what expect what what effect would you expect that would have upon it? Well, that's an awesome question, Dan. I don't know the answer because we don't have our microbiome lab functioning yet, but I will make a point of trying to find the answer to that question. Um, what would you presume? I, I don't know. I the, the material that we're developing, the seed flare, is so rapidly absorbed into the seed that I don't expect the damage would be significant. And our, our anecdotal observation is that we have remarkably greater uh, microbial colonization than we have ever had before. Um, and so just anecdotally, you can visually see it on the root systems and you compare root systems, you have got um, several yeah. multiples more root biomass and better aggregation right around the root hairs or the, 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 the fine roots than we've ever had before. So Anecdotally, just from visual observation, I would say we're, we're definitely getting much greater impacts on the microbial population overall, but are we affecting specific species negatively, perhaps, that we don't know that aren't measuring? Maybe so. We need to find out. But so just while you're giving recipes, you know, I'm assuming there's some kind of a humic buffering material along with this, um, this uh, trace. Don't do, don't, do this to me, Dan. don't do this to me, Dan. Okay. I will just, I will just say that. Um <laughs> And then I will say, uh, <laughs> um, I believe the core microbiome in many cases is in a sporulated form. So perhaps that is less less um, vulnerable than other, right. other forms of microbiome. Yep. Yeah. Right. And but you, what any, you're effectively- Any dormant stages would be less vulnerable. So, so the core microbiome may not be such a concern. And then therefore, but the, the effective point is you would be putting this kind of material onto the, the, the seed before applying a product like biochemical gold or any other kind of inoculant in the order, that's the order operations. Yes. Um, and I had a question as well about the regulations that inhibit you from allowing or, or, or the strategic position you're in when I go, when I'm here in Europe, I'm in Scotland right now, I go to various places and like, we can't get biochemical gold is, I mean, what's the strategic trajectory for the company in getting access for people from other continents to your products, specifically some um, of these core pieces? Well, the uh, there is a regulatory aspect to your questions, which I'm not prepared to answer off the top of my head. 
but our intentions are for AEA to be in the UK and in Europe. Um, and we have already begun the regulatory applications process to get our products approved there. So it's really a question of the, how rapidly or how slow do the bureaucrats move. It could be when the regulators move, it could be six months, it could be three years. Um, I don't expect it to be three years, but it's probably going to be 12 to 18 months, um, perhaps less in, in certain parts of Europe. Um, and similarly in Australia, uh, we're expecting to be in Australia in a similar timeline. Um, we are already doing some work in Eastern Europe and in Turkey and Bulgaria uh, and some of those countries. Um, so the uh, advancing eco-agriculture is intent on becoming an international company very quickly over the course of the next 12 to 18 months. And how about Africa? We have a lot of attendees from Africa this conference. Um, South Africa, for certain. I think we also have a lot of demand from um, Kenya and Uganda and Zimbabwe, a couple of other countries, but I, I'm not really in the day-to-day -day of what all that decision-making involves. So I don't know that for certain, but I will say it this way. As a company, we are uh, we're prepared uh, mentally, emotionally, and otherwise to expand internationally very quickly. And so if you would have a desire to have our products, in the past, I think people have maybe haven't reached out to us because they just the, the default assumption was that we weren't there and we wouldn't be accessible. That has changed. That default assumption should now change. You should reach out to us and say, hey, I want to have access to your products um, in, in this country, and we can seek to facilitate that. Brilliant. Uh, Erwin? Yeah, as a, <clears throat> as a vegetable seed grower, uh, John, of course, there is a big task for me to... Uh, enhance the crappy seed as it is uh, till now on the marketplace. You have the opportunity um, to make seed flare irrelevant. <laughs> uh, I cannot produce seed for everyone, but um, I'm kind of saddened <laughs> when you when you talk about how crappy the seed is, and hopefully my seed will be a little bit better. And my buyers, my seed companies, um, they give me clues that it is better. They don't have to do warm water treatment, and they have mm -hmm. high um, uh, germination percentages and so on. Um, we grow it with a lot of companion crops, like uh, 25, uh, one third of grasses, one third of legumes, and one third of forbs or herbs, as you say it. And um, I am wondering what else can I do, probably in the latter stage of the seed production life of a plant, to enhance the seed that much that I give most of my quality to it. Um. I just a, a broad kind of general answer is um, seeds generally require much higher mineral and trace, particularly trace mineral concentrations than as other parts of the plant. So the requirements, uh, or let me say it this way, when you supply the, the, the same minerals that I was talking about being present in the seed flare, when you supply generous levels, significantly higher levels than what are commonly recommended of zinc and manganese and copper and cobalt and molybdenum and selenium, et cetera. Um, the result almost invariably is much larger and much heavier seed. Uh, we have we have a number of, of instances where working with grain crops, they have put on foliar applications of trace minerals late, um, as in within the last two to four weeks before harvest and produced um, grains that had almost double the test weight. Um, 16... So this is after bloom, you mean? Yes, after this is, the this is within the last several weeks before harvest. Oh. Doubling yeah. test weight? We had uh, we had oats go 64 pounds from a 32 pound standard. <laughs> I think you told me a story many years ago about a tomato seed grower who had asked to work with you about, um, you know, producing higher quality seed and and you gave them a sort of a protocol, and I'm not sure if it's him or her, but um, uh, then their their seeds were rejected by their buyer because they were too large and not enough seeds per pound, which yeah. is completely perverse, which speaks to the nature of the seed industry. Um, but yeah, we've been having this conversation for many years. <laughs> There's a few anecdotes out there. Yeah, <clears throat> if you're a, if you're a seed buyer, then um, the reality is you want. Well, yeah, just pay attention, pay attention to test weight and pay attention to seed size because you want um, you want larger seed. You want the largest and the heaviest seed, a combination of the largest and heaviest seed that you can find. 
and and potentially for nutrition, if we're talking about test weight, and we think that there's a connection between test weight and nutrient value, you know, in grain, for instance, the heavier the the pound, the number of bushels, uh, the pounds per bushel, it's presumed to be the you know it's a, you, premiums are are offered. So for an, any any producer of food, effectively potentially, you're arguing for high applications of trace elements in foliar sprays at the end of growing yep. season. Yep. We've actually, uh, our, the reason we're seeing this as application being so commonly done on small grain crops is that they're applying them for disease control. So if they have challenges with uh, with rust or with fusarium or various head blights moving in the last couple of weeks before harvest, we've learned that we can put on high application rates of these trace mineral metals instead of a fungicide application. And they're actually, they will, in many cases, they are more effective than the fungicides at preventing the disease. They can actually reverse the presence of a disease that's already established on a, on a seed head. And in parallel, we also get these ridiculously high test weights. And the other questions. Any other questions, comments, uh, Urban or Adrian, before I jump in? I what do you think up. about the diversity planting? What kind of an effect will that have on the seed quality? It from what we from what we've observed we know it does have a positive effect but i don't know that we've actually done a good job of measuring the positive effect that it has both in terms of the microbiome and in terms of the nutritional values and mineral values and uh, the overall the phytonutrient complexity we know that it makes a difference um i'm one of the things that i'm really looking forward to with the microbiome lab um Dr. James White has told us that when we have a corn seed that hasn't been um, completely denatured and stripped and sterilized through very difficult growing practices, uh, a, a reasonably healthy corn seed will have 9 billion bacteria within it, inside the seed. And uh, these bacterial endophytes. And so the... We know that plants share their microbiome and they, they share species. And so I would expect there is a degree to which when you have a diversity of companion plants, there is a degree to which uh, the microbiome of other associated plants will enhance the microbiome within the seed and you will have a more diverse microbiome inside the seed itself. Um, so I think there's there's likely to be a lot of value in in growing seeds in a biodiverse ecosystem. But this is me speculating at this point. The good news is in six months from now, we're going to be able to measure exactly what the differences are. Brilliant. I was right. speculating the same thing to my seed buyers and it's all nice, but now we need something to test it with. Yep. And uh, I guess you got the answer there, John. <laughs> so maybe from a regulatory perspective, it's easier to get this technique on my seeds to test it, then get the products here. Yeah. Well, you know, what's interesting is that um, just in the, in the case of if, if I want to develop a microbial product, let's say a BioCoat Gold, for example, in order to get it through regulatory approval here in North America, there has to be a single lab report, one piece of paper, one report that's run at one lab that measures everything that's in the product. And that is a challenge because the labs which measure mycorrhizal fungi don't measure bacteria. <laughs> it's, uh, the, so we, uh, this, has been, this has been a challenge for us historically and having the opportunity to have a lab that, and a laboratory assay, a uh, certified assay that can measure hundreds or thousands of different uh, microorganisms all in a single shot is, is could be a game changer from a regulatory perspective. All of a sudden, we might have products showing up with labels of hundreds or thousands of different microorganisms rather than 10 or 12. And is that the primary reason why you have limited the number of microorganisms that are on the label? I thought at some point you had told me about the fact that some families were considered to be, you know, germ warfare, you know, kinds of things. And so even, or maybe that was the Tanio stuff, like they was, you know, one family of bacillus is beneficial and other families are detrimental. And so you can't, you don't want to put them on there because the wrong kind of things get said, or should I use no. something more to respond to that question? No, um, the you asked the most 
provocative questions sometimes, Dan. Um, <laughs> The in in a, in a in the case of a number of these products, uh, the microorganisms that they contain are in the states are recognized as beneficial, and in Europe, they're considered phytosanitary, meaning that they actually have disease suppressive effects. So that if you if you spray these organisms on a plant leaf surface, they are actually registered and labeled as biocontrols, and the products that we are using in the states. We're using 10 times or sometimes 100 times higher concentrations of these same organisms that are being used in Europe as a biocontrol, and we're just applying it as a biostimulant or as a plant health improvement with remarkable results. It's just a different regulatory framework. Yeah. Dietmar, did you have a question or comment? Yeah, hello, Jürich. I hear you. Hi, Dietmar. Good to connect with you again. Mm. Ich habe leider nicht alles verstanden. Ich verstehe euch so schlecht. Erwin besser. Aber he didn't get everything, but he hears me better. Yeah. I think John might even be able to translate directly and not need you in the middle. I'm not no, sure. We, we tried that last time. It no, okay. doesn't work. All right. <laughs> Aber eine Frage, wenn ihr mit dem Biometer-Messgerät fertig seid von der Laura Kovina, uh, wo wollt ihr das zuerst einsetzen? So one question, when you're ready with Laura Kavanaugh's biometer device, where do you want to uh, put it first to work? Uh, we're going to be establishing a lab here in Ohio first. And uh, as we develop a business in Europe and elsewhere, I'm sure it will make sense to have other laboratories in other locations. Um, so to be to communicate clearly, um, originally, I was quite inspired by Laura's device and her work, and I had this understanding that it could be a, a handheld device that could readily be used in the field. And it's true that the device itself is very small and is, can readily be a handheld device, but the DNA extraction um, methodology itself is a laboratory bench extraction process. So it needs to be conducted in a lab. And uh, so from that perspective, it it doesn't really, it's not really something that is farmer friendly or f something you can do on the back of a pickup truck, truck or even in a farm shop very easily. So we, it is going to end up being a laboratory based process. And on a follow up on that, <clears throat> I, I, as I understand from PFLA and other sorts of microbiome assessments, as soon as you remove the soil, say from the, from the, um, the land and you put it in a bag and you put it in the mail, the microbiome begins to shift based on the environmental conditions. And so, you know, even if you rush it in the mail, it, you know, in two days, you get an entirely different um, spectrum of species present. What's, what, what, what say you to that? Um, Laura has been testing this. We have, I think she's been the, the oldest samples that she has at this point are 18 months or maybe 24 months at this point. And we're finding that to not be true with this methodology for the simple reason that it's sensitive enough that it also measures things that are not alive. So even when uh, it's true that the, the live microbiome begins to shift with exposure to yeah. oxygen and everything else, but as those microorganisms die, let's say you freeze the sample, um, you are still able to get repeatable, replicable uh, microbiome sequencing data um, from those non-living microorganisms where the DNA is still present in the profile. Wonderful. And are you looking at concentrations or just presences or, and how do you intend to integrate this into the, into the AI agronomist? Um, yeah. Um, so I'm sorry, what was the first part of your question again? Is it, is it just the presence or concentrations? Yeah. Um, it's still early days. Uh, Laura is of the persuasion that we will be able to show concentrations to a degree. Um, you can certainly, obviously, measuring the presence or the absence of something is going to be relatively easy. But you can also measure uh, the number of times that a certain sequence is measured compared with all the others. So you'll be able to develop a ratio of types to say, okay, we we read this genome sequence 50 times more than that genome sequence. So we'll be able to develop a ratio of sorts. And the the objective presumably is to be help to be able to help um, farmers <clears throat> modulate their management practices in relatively near real time, 
I mean, I would presume that's the rationale behind doing this. It's not because we have we were just getting a PhD or something. So what's the presumed turnaround time? And and do you want to talk about what the how you see the the implications being sort of um rolling out of people doing this? Well, in my opinion, um again, this is my opinion because the reality is this is a new frontier and we're going to learn so much that we yep. don't know right now. Yep. We're going to be able to, one of the ways that we could utilize this technology is to compare the effectiveness of a product. <laughs> I applied compost tea here and I didn't apply compost tea here. What are the differences in the microbiome? I applied this inoculant here. I didn't apply it here. What are the differences in the microbiome? You're going to be able to measure the actual effectiveness of a microbial inoculant in ways that we've never been able to before. That's part one. The, the other piece that I suspect we will find is we, we will learn, and we need to learn this because, again, I think there's a certain proportion, perhaps a large proportion of our current knowledge of the things we think we know that might not actually be so. Yeah. For example, one of the things that um, is commonly communicated that we think we know is this group of fungal foods that we need to have humic substances, humic substances and, and high oil content products like high oil content liquid fish to utilize as a fungal food. And yet I've observed that the, the crops and the fields with the most amazing mycorrhizal fungal colonization were soils that were fed primarily bacterial foods. Um, because those bacterial foods stimulated the bacterial population, which then had the effect of stimulating the, the mycorrhizal mm. fungi um, population. So um, the, the, the next stage outcome of that is to say, okay, uh, in, and I would expect that within 12 to 18 months, perhaps sooner, all of a sudden we will be able to say, all right, and this particular soil type with this microbiome profile and this crop would benefit from these types of companion plants because of their microbiome. It would benefit from these types of inoculants and not those. And it would benefit from these types of microbial stimulants and not those. All of a sudden, we're going to be able to generate some guidelines around what cultural management practices and what types of products would be beneficial to shift the microbiome in a certain direction and which to avoid in a, in a given situation. And that is information that right now, there is this large gap, at least in, in my mind, um, there are other people who are more experienced than I am in this particular space. But in my mind, there's a large gap between you run a microscope and you look at the soil microbial community through a microscope or you get a PLFA analysis. And how do you translate that into management decisions? Like, what do you do with that information? There, there's a big gap there. Um, and maybe it's just simply because I don't understand it well enough. But it's it's my hope to be able to completely close that gap with this next generation technology. Absolutely brilliant. <clears throat> Absolutely and brilliant. This was what I'm also wondering. I, I saw many biomakers reports and you see like, uh, I have a lack in phosphorus mobilizing bacteria. And you look at the soil analysis, there is high phosphorus content. So of course there is a lack, but uh, often with those reports of biomakers, I don't know what to change. Shall I now apply phosphorus mobilizing bacteria or <laughs> where do I get those trains and how should I know if they work in my soils? And uh, exactly. I think this is the biggest challenge in those tests. And the same thing is um, I read many articles. It doesn't matter what kind of bacteria has, it matters what kind of metabolic and uh, the metabolomics tests are also very valuable. Yep. Um, you think you also go a bit into this direction or how you will yeah. come over those challenges? Yeah, yeah, a lot. Per spot on, Adrian. Um, the I've been having this conversation with Laura and to understand is, do we necessarily need to identify a particular species? Because the, 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 same, the same technology um, has the ability, as I understand it, to identify uh, specific genomes and specific genetic characteristics. Yeah, it can analyze um, which genes are active. The exactly. Way yeah. Exactly. So, 
when we have active genes of of phytase enzymes and and uh, all these and phosphatase enzymes, when these genes are active, do we need to know which microorganism it is? Maybe not. Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> probably not. Yeah. <laughs> Are we going to get get into, into pleomorphism, John, or not? No, no, no. We're not touching pleomorphism <laughs> yet. Okay. <laughs> uh, brilliant, brilliant. Uh, how about um, the AI agronomist? This is something you've been sharing with me for a few years now. I mean, is is this? I mean, is, it, this is effectively is aiming towards that grand vision. Do yep. you want to tie it all together for us, or you already sort of have? Dan. I think you qualify for the title of rabble rouser today. <laughs> um, <laughs> I say this only because I'm good friends with Dan, and we've been yes, yes. Time. We can, that was that, that was a backhanded compliment. I think is yeah. what it was. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, of course, when you have a microbiome report that gives you an order of magnitude more data than a biomaker's report, which is already very complex, you can easily get data overwhelm. When you get when you have a handheld sensor that you can take to the field and measure not just a full mineral profile but also a phytonutrient panel of hundreds of phytonutrients, it's easy to get data overwhelm. And so the logical pathway is to have a digital software platform that takes all of this information and translates it. First of all, makes it very accessible, very easy to understand, very easy to interpret, but also gives uh, access to the background information behind it if people want to see that, but then also translates it into actual recommendations. And uh, we already have a working version of this software internally at AEA that we have been using. And uh, our intent is to release that and make it publicly available at the same time as we release uh, the handheld sensors and the biome, uh, the microbiome lab, so that there will be uh, a digital interface where people can look at this information or perhaps even input their own tissue analysis or soil analysis data that they have. And um, it will, along with other historical information, disease, insect pressure, et cetera, et cetera, and it will generate um, an agronomic recommendation. We've We've already been using this software internally, and um, it is, at this point, um, it is obviously faster and more repeatable than our human consultants. Um, yep. So all of a sudden, that makes that makes this information very accessible to anyone globally. The implications of that are massive, completely massive. Yeah, Dietmar? Uh, eine Frage noch, bitte. Also wir arbeiten hier intensiv mit einer Pyramide der Pflanzengesundheit. Kartoffelbestände beispielsweise, die wir auf 12 Prozent Bricks gehalten haben, die haben nur ganz verhalten bis gar keine Phytophthora. Wie ist es mit dem Virus? Äh, wo würdest du den Virus einstufen bei deiner Pyramide? Wie können wir den Virus raushalten aus den Beständen? So, he says we work a lot with the plant health pyramid here in Europe and when we have... Um potato fields that have a bricks over 12, we have less problems with the late blight infections. Um, but this question is, where do virus, viruses uh, fit in into the plant health pyramid? Where do we need to focus to get out the viruses? If you were in North America, I would say you need to call AEA because that's uh, <laughs> some of our trade craft. But um, the answer is that viruses <laughs> respond specifically to abundant concentrations of the high atomic weight elements that are required. So particularly selenium, uh, when you have generous levels of selenium, when you have generous levels of uh, molybdenum, and also to some degree zinc, uh, we have been able to, there, there appear to be two levels of what happens. The first is that you, no long, you still have the presence of the virus, but you no longer get viral expression. And um, what we have observed so far is that then in the in the following generation, if the viral expression gets shut down in one generation, the seed in the next generation no longer has the presence of virus uh, even showing up in the tests. And as you're you're growing seed potatoes, so as you're very familiar with uh, actually doing viral testing on potato seed from one generation to the next, and those those were some of the examples that we've seen. Brilliant. Um, we got only just one more minute left. There was time for us to engage the people on the um, 
on the on the chat with their questions. Um, we haven't much talked about the meter that you were just about jumping with joy about, John. And you tried to control yourself, but this this handheld sensor in the field is just completely brilliant. Um, I mean, I got so many things to say about it. Maybe we don't have time for it today, but um, I mean, you said there was two meters, so two two sensors so far. You didn't tell us at all what the third sensor is. I mean, are we talking about price points at all? Can you? I mean. It's premature, um, right? The only thing that I can say at this point is that it's going to be readily accessible and affordable. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't want to put a number out there and then something unforeseen or unexpected comes up, and oh, I need to retract that. But um, the the business model is still being developed. Um, the The discussion at this point is that we will not be selling the device uh, only because we expect to rapidly prototype and rapidly go through multiple harder hardware iterations. Yep. So our uh, thought process generally is that um, we will we will uh, give the device away for a deposit, uh, for a security deposit, and we will charge a subscription for the samples that are run through it. And there will be the expectation of a certain minimum threshold number of samples. And then um, as the hardware upgrades, we will simply be replacing the devices every year, every couple of years for the first uh, as the device further develops. Brilliant. But I mean, the implications of this for, like I said, again, there's a number of people from Africa that are on this conference for being able to have access to real-time sophisticated nutrient assessments in field and be able to turn that into recommendations. The, the, the implications are completely massive. Yep. It's just, I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the planet does not have access it to this. It, it democratizes, it democratizes, it eliminates laboratories. I mean, this is a complete yeah. laboratory replacement. It's absolutely massive. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. Well, we've got 15 questions in the Q and A and we'll see how many of them we can get to. Um, um, let me see. Anonymous attendee says how micro, mycorrhizal fung fungal spores are generated. What are the best conditions? Um, I'll, maybe I'll just add on to this. I thought it was quite important your your initial opening point about the fact that most um, <clears throat> species of microbes are only reproduced in the presence of living roots, and so the concept of of uh, Johnson Sioux compost <laughs> uh, micro you know um, inoculant produ production and compost teas and all that kind of stuff. What was the percent you said? So the microbes can only be propagated in the presence of living roots. Was ninety plus percent? Ninety plus percent. Some, some 90 plus or say 95 percent 95 percent of microbial spores cannot be microbes do not reproduce unless they're in the presence of a living root that's exactly right i mean sit with that one for a second that is a massive massive data point um, means, for a lot of people it yeah. means so, no matter how awesome your johnson sue compost tea is you can have the very best possible out there and produce great results with it. Let me be clear. I am not, I'm a Johnson Sioux compost and compost team is a great practice. I'm in completely in favor of, but you're still missing the majority of the microbial population. Yeah. All right. Um, we've got a long one here from Sue. Currently in Kenya, farmers have taken the Kenyan government to court for provision in the 2012 Seed and Plant Varieties Act that makes it illegal for farmers to share, exchange, or sell uncertified or unindexed seeds. These rules also make it illegal for farmers to engage with the business of exchanging, sharing, or selling seed unless they are registered as seed merchants. The punitive measures include a two-year jail term or a fine of $1 million, uh, was effectively $7,700. We are considering supporting the current farmer case, which hinges on seed sovereignty and culture, or starting another case focusing on the science of the seed biome and rhizophagy. If you were in our shoes, what would you consider the three most critical points that we should highlight in our more scientific position? Uh, my goodness, that's a question that deserves a serious more answer than perhaps we can provide in this webinar. But first of I'm all, happy to make an introduction think, to Sue. Yeah, congratulations. I think you're doing the right thing. I think you should pursue that. Um, there's one. I can't think of three points right off the top of my head, but I can think of one that is very important. I think it's important for everyone to be aware of. Uh, and so I'll share that right now. And that is um, what we've learned from Dr. James White's work. Actually, I, I would suggest James White is the is the expert you need to speak with uh, in regards to uh, a legal 
uh, recourse rather than myself because he is really the expert here and I'm sure he would be delighted to help. Um, what we've learned from Dr. White is that when seeds are, or when plants are propagated through cell culture, they lose their associated microbiome. And this is important because what this means is when you have a commercially produced seed line, let's take corn, for example, when you have a commercially produced seed line, part of that propagation process is propagating it through cell culture. And the cell culture process, they of course seek to sterilize that entire environment, soak it with antibiotics and everything else to kill all the microorganisms and everything else that is present, except for those few primordial cells that they are seeking to, pro seeking to propagate. And so what happens is that these commercial seed varieties that were propagated through cell culture have lost the majority of their associated um, healthy endophytes and have, a, have lost the majority of their microbiome, which then when they are planted into the soil, they seek to resolve and to rectify by uh, recruiting microbes from the soil microbiome. And they are only successful to the degree that that soil actually contains a beneficial microbiome. They may not be successful, and they may only be successful in, in recruiting 10% or 30% or maybe 70% of the species that they originally had. So um, we need to begin thinking of seeds. And to, to the point, uh, Erwin, that you were asking earlier about uh, growing seeds in a biodiverse um, environment with a diversity of plant species, we need to start thinking of plant species and we need to start thinking of seeds as microbial inoculants. Every little seed, a corn seed, contains 9 billion microorganisms. And so all of these seeds share their microorganisms with each other. And when you have commercially propagated seed and the entire marketplace is restricted to that, you now are removing the microbiome support for drought adaptation, for example. Uh, you, you are creating a... Uh, a seed or a genetic ecosystem that is very sensitive to collapse and that no longer has not just the genetic resilience, but also the associated microbiome resilience to respond to environmental stresses. Brilliant. <clears throat> um, and and may perhaps a bit, a bit of a follow on, Jackie asks, is there any market difference between organic heirloom seeds and other commercial seeds, including GMO seeds? I think you effectively answered that question, but do you yeah. want to just... Couple more sentences, just no. no. <laughs> and I think Erwin, uh, uh, when you were speaking at your presentation a couple of weeks ago, you said that um, if your potatoes begin to exhibit evolutionary <laughs> dynamics, then you can't call them that variety anymore, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's yeah. profoundly perverse how the regulations are <laughs> effectively established to facilitate the, the colonization <laughs> of the of the, the the diversity i mean it's 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 i mean perhaps not a surprise but uh i think it's worth worth emphasizing yeah <clears throat> um a small point no one's asks uh john are you talking about the cotyledons or true leaves in your seed treatment i think with the reference to the to the cotton seed both in the case of the cotton seed i was these seeds that appeared to be or these um these leaves that appeared to be plastic i'm talking about the cotyledon leaves uh and also the first true leaf um and I shared those uh, those uh, photos on you social did. media, so anyone can go back to any of my social media channels and look at that. Um, and when I'm referring to the leaves that I want to turn dark green and begin photosynthesizing immediately, that's both the cotyledons and the first true leaf. Like it needs to happen right away. Yeah. Uh, Paluka asks, would it be possible to, to collaborate with someone in Europe to help bring or make them here? I think perhaps she's referring to the BioCode Gold or maybe also to the, um, the Seed Flare. Uh, I mean, your protocol right now, your assumption is that you're only manufacturing in North America and then shipping? No, that's, or That's not our assumption at all. We expect, okay, well, to, be, we expect to have a manufacturing presence in Europe and uh, in Australia and other parts of the world relatively soon. Okay. Good and to if, know. if any of you, uh, it, considering that we have such a significant international audience here, the, the person that you should uh, speak with or connect with inside AEA is Kish Johnson. Um, and his email is fairly straightforward. It's kjohnson at advancingecoag.com. Anonymous attendee again asks, is there specific microbial strains slash microbes that may be necessary to enhance degradation of the glyphosate level? 
uh, there are specific microbial strains that are adapted to that and that, that have been, uh, for lack of a better term, that have been trained to do that um, and that have adapted to uh, remediate both glyphosate and uh, amino methanol phosphonic acid, AMPA. Um, and, you know, the other, the other piece that is, that is going to be interesting from a regulatory perspective, there was an interesting um, journal article published just in the last week. Uh, it was popularized by Toby Kears, and uh, it was describing the, the global distribution of the microbiome, and they were, they were specifically measuring uh, fungal global distribution by measuring fungal spores in air currents. And uh, this is where we have this interesting tap dance uh, dance to navigate, where regu regulators love to say that, uh, well, you can't import this microbial product from over there because it's going to be different from our microbiome here. Like we literally have Canadian regulators saying that from a product that's manufactured 30 miles away from the border, which is just ludicrous. Um, but actually this, this paper that was published was reporting that, uh, yes, it's true. There are specific microorganisms associated with specific plant species that are somewhat localized, but generally these these uh, more broadly adaptive species are present universally. They're carried on air currents. They're carried on the jet stream. They're carried around the globe. There's much. There's a much greater degree of universality than there is a degree of specificity. We're touching closer and closer to pleomorphism as well, but I will <laughs> hold a step step back from that line. So I'll I'll try to. Um, no one. I think perhaps in line with this comment, how can one talk about a particular microbiome organism distribution when I, we known how many variables there are in any soil plant ecosystem that may quickly change which organisms are present. I'm not quite sure I follow the complete logic of that statement. Um, we can't talk about any particular microbiome of any organism because they do modulate. I think that's the point he's making. Yeah, they do modulate. And again, um, I think... Again, this is this is partially speculation on my part because we don't have a good data set, and I'm so looking forward to not having to say that in the future. Yes, but my understanding is that um, the key drivers of the microbial species in a given soil or given an ecosystem are the plant species that are present. So again, coming back, we need to think of plants. We need to think of seeds as microbial inoculants, as vectors for certain microbial populations. So the reality is that when we, uh, the, the, the ideal that uh, we should strive for is that as this microbiome lab uh, develops and we develop more data and more familiarity with that data, uh, when we get a report back, there should be a set of recommendations. Ultimately, there should be a set of recommendations that flows from that report. And recommendation one should be, here are the plant species that vector the microbes that you need to fix this problem. Brilliant. And recommendation two should be, if none of these plants fit your farming ecosystem, here are microbial inoculants that you can try, and they're likely to be second best to what this plant species would be. And as I think you've been saying for years, it's the plants that build soil. Without yep. plants, we don't have soil. I think that's a point that's critically important that people may not actually properly understand the implications of. Do you want to just take a second to... to, to... I you know, saw an awesome quote on, on a social media channel somewhere recently that said, um, mainstream farmers grow plants from soil and regenerative farmers grow soil from plants. And I think that captures it up pretty quite perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> Better think of that one until you get it, because that's a big one. <laughs> that really does capture, <laughs> it does capture it. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, Sherry. Um, are there any plans to collaborate or invite nutritionists or dietitians into this community so they can begin to value this new technology data as a form of nutrient density and thus support these agricultural practices? The way that I would say it is that the, the foundational intent behind the development of this, of this um, handheld sensor is to democratize data to make data freely, readily available with no restrictions. So I would be very disappointed if nutritionists and doctors didn't utilize it to start actually measuring the quality of outcomes, measuring the quality of the, the produce, the fruits, the vegetables, the grains, et cetera, that are being produced. 
And um, I would entirely expect that to be the case. Are we going to restrict that? Uh, no. Are we going to particularly invite them in? I think um, there's, I expect there's going to be a large degree of that just happening spontaneously. Yeah. This is too big and too powerful for any number of people not to be jumping into this fray, I would say. And those who are not are going to be missing the missing the boat. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> perhaps Derek's comment here is just, a, a, again, an addendum to that. Are you aiming to integrate an application integration interface or an API into yes. your data set? Yes. Okay. Brilliant. Which means that all kinds of people's, you know, data structures can access this information and integrate it into their frameworks. Yeah. It's and of course, just... that, that is within the context, like we, we have to be uh, very careful about ownership of the data. Like it's the farmers, the growers, whoever's collecting the data owns the data. Say that again. <laughs> whoever's collecting the data owns the data. That's what we've, we've, we've felt very strongly about that at the BFA is one of our thesis and all of our research with nutrient density. You know, it's not the person who's doing the research that owns data. It's the farmer who's, or the person who's in the act of collecting it who has a prerogative to share it and potentially monetize it as well? Is that part of your vision? Potentially. I I, I haven't seen, that isn't a part of the vision at this point. The vision, as, as some models anytime, you, anytime you start a new project, the vision tends to grow and you find your pathway forward, but that's not our intention at this point. Okay. Um, Mandy asks if you can repeat that great quote. I think it was about the... Yeah. Contemporary, I'll, I'll paraphrase it and put it into my own words. Contemporary farmers grow plants from soil. Regenerative farmers grow soil from plants. Effectively meaning that when you're using chemical fertilizers and such to produce plants, you wear out the soil. There's less soil there when you get done harvesting than when you started versus yeah. when you're working with nature. The act of producing crops builds soil. So yeah, yeah that's very powerful. Um, <clears throat> uh, let me see, um, anonymous attendee, again, a bunch of questions from you today, whoever you are, obviously anonymous, uh, would really be great to hear your thoughts on supporting the sector transition to regenerative ag. I've heard you touch on this in a few podcasts, but it would be great if you could do a bit of a deeper dive into what you would consider a regenerative roadmap. What do you consider to be the conditions for success? Thanks. You want me to answer that in five minutes or less? There was no time consideration given, but we do have yeah thirteen minutes and eight, eight open questions, and they are continuing to come in. Yeah, <clears throat> I think you need to send me that question, Dan, and I need to do a podcast on that question specifically. Um, well, the this this could be a broad, nuanced response. Yeah, but. I'm going to narrow it down to one thing, which is that you cannot regenerate anything without the input of energy. There needs to be energy input to sustain all the living organisms at all various levels. Now, when you are thinking about energy input in terms of an ecosystem, regenerating an ecosystem, then the only way you have of bringing new energy into an ecosystem in a significant way is by capturing sunlight. But there is a prerequisite for that, and that is the interaction of humans on the landscape. There are two very different worldviews, two very different points of view about the interactions of, of people on the land. The one point of view is that People are parasites, and the best way to regenerate ecosystems is to remove people from those ecosystems, and that, in fact, when things are untouched, and the word that is often associated with untouched is unspoiled, that is the fastest way to regenerate. The second point of view is that humans are the ultimate hyper-keystone species that they influence all the other keystone species and that when they when humans truly engage with an ecosystem from a loving stewardship relationship perspective 
the fastest way to regenerate ecosystems is to actually have engaged stewards and engaged people in collaboration with that ecosystem and caring for it and loving it. And it's obviously, I subscribe to the second worldview, not the first one. But in order to do that, in order to have people in the landscape, um, and in order to have a, a, lar a larger number of stewards, which we need, in the uh, financial construct world that we live in right now, they need energy that is not sunlight. They need energy that is financial support. And so ultimately, from my if we gel this all the way down to foundational first principles perspective, if we want to facilitate the adoption and facilitate rapid regeneration on scale, there needs to be a pathway to compensating those stewards very well. Now, there could be multiple possible pathways that can be achieved by many different mechanisms and means, but by whatever means it is achieved, it does need to be achieved if we want to have wide scale adoption. Brilliant. I, I just, uh, one perhaps, you know, <laughs> oblique comment. I'm, I'm here in Scotland at the, um, I just, I think I sent John perhaps a, a picture this morning of the the castle of the Stuart Kings that I'm um, <laughs> at um, and the Stuart ship and the stewardship and the King James is the King James Bible is that was a Stuart and the uh, Mary Queen of Scots and, um, it goes back. It's really interesting to think about these the the words we use and and the stewardship, the um, you know the seven generation concept of the North American indigenous community about decisions for um, cultural decisions can only be made when they be determined to be best for the seventh generation in the future. Um, yeah, I'm. I think if you actually follow the logical implications of the work that you've been doing, John, and and these sensors and the data and 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 all of that AI, you know, we have at our fingertips the opportunity to profoundly positively shift the dynamic on this planet in very short order. Yes, it, it is. It is categorical at this point that. You know, you can you can have a hard time with technology. You can have a hard time with science. Certainly, they've been used for very negative ends. Humans have done destructive things, but it's not about science good, science bad, technology good, technology bad. It's about how we use our capacity to perceive and discern um, to affect the reality around us. And um, I, for one, am extraordinarily bullish on the positive opportunities here. Um, it just really feels like. It's just going to be a couple of years and we're going to have everything turned around, right? I mean, it just feels like it. <laughs> the trajectory I see is is uh, quite amazing. Yeah. Possibility for that certainly exists. Um, there is there is an, an upsetting of the status quo that is currently in place. Um, but, you know, there's, there's one other thought that I will share. Um, Ray Dalio expressed this in a very succinct paragraph in one of his more recent books um, titled Principles for Dealing with a Changing World Order. And uh, we it's easy to recognize the principle of this to be true, but he actually studied history and had the data to back up this point. He said that at any point in history, when there is a significant change in trajectory of an empire or an organization or a country, there is always one person who was, you could say, standing in the breach. There was one person who was instrumental in determining the direction of the future. And I think that is a message for all of us. Are we prepared to be that person? Are we, are we preparing ourselves? Are we constantly learning uh, how to articulate our ideas and how to persuade other people and how to communicate effectively and how to be the person for a moment such as this when that time comes. Because we are, the, the very fact that all of you are here on this call, having this conversation and listening to this conversation puts you in the top fractions of a percent of people who are actually aware of the impact and the implications that regenerative agriculture can have on public health, on societal health, on ecosystem health. And 
All of us need to prepare ourselves to be ready in those key pivotal moments because we will be called upon. If we're not ready, the only piece that will happen is a re-entrenchment of the status quo. Brilliant. <clears throat> Brilliant. Okay, we've got about five minutes left and only five questions. So I think we might make it through here. Um, I've been trying to push them quickly and you've been, you've been uh, playing along nicely. <laughs> uh, Chris has two points. Uh, I think looks like one is his question and one is maybe his conclusion, but let's just, I'll read them out and see if you see if you uh, comment. Um, from what I can understand, we, whether we are smallholder, householder producers or commercial farmers are operating slash producing in suboptimal conditions with suboptimal information. That being said, is there a historical moment when production was optimal, or are we potentially entering entirely new terrain? That's his question. And then 10 minutes later, he says, my question is answered, I think. Assuming that seeds are vectors of gene expression, meaning that by default, it has to be a new emerging terrain. Yes. Um, depending on your point of view, you could say that there was a historical moment in the Garden of Eden, perhaps when things were ideal. Um, but I think there are many instances, many scenarios at a point in time, at a point of ecosystem development in different contexts where Arguably, you could argue that there was optimal ecosystem function and that there was optimal ecosystem health and plant health and, and animal health and human health within that ecosystem. And, but we know that ecosystems are never stagnant. And in the process of cycling, whether that's cycling carbon, cycling nitrogen, sulfur, minerals, all these other uh, minerals, a part of the natural cycles that sometimes uh, you have you have localized cycles and you have macro cycles and sometimes a macro cycle means that a local ecosystem is degrading and somewhere else is improving and um, i think it's important for us to keep in mind that there are very few soils that have uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? Not geological perfection, but that have the geological substrate to provide all of the minerals necessary today for optimal health. Some soils are much more highly weathered than others. Some soils come from very different uh, geological formations from sedimentary rock versus igneous or volcanic rock sources. And um, the reality is that because of our um, both our modern and our historical agricultural practices where soils were tilled, they were exposed to lots of oxidation, they were exposed to lots of rainfall and weathering. There are practically no agricultural soils left on the face of the planet who still have adequate levels of iodine, unless they're in close proximity to the ocean and get ocean mists and so forth. Iodine depletion of soils is almost universal. Selenium depletion of soils is probably greater than 60%. Or, or, and maybe... In some cases, it's not accurate to use the word depletion because dependent on the foundational geological substrate, they never had adequate levels of selenium to begin with. And um, so it's, it's important, I think we are, to answer the question I think you are asking, we have access to information collectively now that we can enter into a new frontier, a place where we have never been before, where we understand that it is necessary to move selenium from some regions into other regions and then to avoid losing it. And that can happen. To avoid, to move iodine from the ocean through seaweeds to agricultural soils and then to keep it there and to avoid losing it or to only lose it as slowly as possible through these macronutrient cycles. So we have the collective information today to have a very different agricultural future, both on an individual household or producer level, as well as on a macro level, if we choose to implement it. Thank you. <clears throat> I'll just, yeah, I think effectively, regardless of what historically was occurring or 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 was not occurring, 
whatever optimal may not have been. We could look at indigenous cultures over over historical time. We can look at geological time and when the dinosaurs were around. The effective point is things could be much better in two years than they are now. And that is something that we have at our fingertips. Exactly. Um, I'm going to assume that that transmutation is off limits, similar mm -hmm. to uh, um, pleomorphism. But right. I want to thank you, John, for an exceptional conversation. This has been brilliant. Um, I just, yeah, I'll just say thank you very much. And it's been an honor <laughs> knowing you as long as I have. And I look forward to at least as many more years uh, going forward. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. This has been an unusual conversation for me to speak about things that we hope to achieve in the near future as compared to things that we've already done in the past. And it feels mildly uncomfortable because I much prefer talking about things that we've already demonstrated and proven. But there is too much good news and too much good opportunities happening to not share. So thank you, Dan, for facilitating this. I've enjoyed our conversation very much. And let's all have fun. The most important piece as yeah. we facilitate the development of a new type of agriculture and human health and ecosystem stewardship is to experience joy while we're doing that and not to allow ourselves be depressed by all the doom and gloom and the things that are less than optimal. That's not going to help anything. Yep. And uh, yeah, thank you for for giving us a, a sneak peek and what's coming down the pike. I, I think you have been, yeah, not perhaps doing it in other, in other platforms. And I'm very honored to have it happen to the degree it has here. All right. Well, thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> and we'll see you again.